Netanyahu with VOA's Middle East Monitor. Coming up, a warning from Iran about its nuclear facilities. Sanctions have an unintended effect on Iran's tourism industry. Egyptian films dominate an Arab film festival. It's a mixture of um, narrative and, and fact, and at the same time reflecting what was going on in the streets. And what role does humor play in the Arab Spring? It's all ahead on The Voice of America. Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad has warned the United States and Israel against carrying out an attack on his country's nuclear facilities, suspected by the West of being part of an atomic weapons development program. In an interview with Egyptian newspaper Al-Akbar, published today, Mr. Ahmadinejad says Iran will not allow anyone to take action against it. He says Iran's military capabilities are increasing and causing fear in the United States and Israel. But Mr. Ahmadinejad repeated his stance that Iran's nuclear program is peaceful. U.S. media say a report to be released this week by the U.N. Nuclear Agency will reveal intelligence that shows Iran has carried out work on developing nuclear weapons technology. The Washington Post says Western diplomats and nuclear experts who reviewed the intelligence believe Iran has developed a device to trigger a nuclear weapon with the help of a Russian scientist and other foreign experts. A former official with the International Atomic Energy Agency told the newspaper that the advancements include obtaining the design for and testing of a capsule of explosives used to trigger a nuclear explosion. The New York Times reports that officials briefed on the intelligence say Iran has a facility some believe is used to test such a device. Iranian cleric Ayatollah Ahmed Khatami warned IAEA chief Yukiya Amano today against releasing a report of lies, saying that would hurt the U.N. agency's credibility. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov today cautioned against military action against Iran, saying it would be a serious mistake, leading to unpredictable consequences. He said there is no military solution to the Iranian nuclear issue. When you're speaking about travel and tourism to Iran, you can't overlook the question of U.S. and international sanctions imposed against Iran as part of the ongoing dispute over its controversial nuclear program. The sanctions were never meant to target Iran's travel and tourism industries, but VOA's Maina Rabi reports their effect is felt in numerous ways. Good afternoon, absolute travel. Absolute Travel in Manhattan has been sending American tourists to Iran for more than a decade, in part, says company president Ken Fish, because he was able to find a tour operator in Tehran to manage things on the Iran side. When I selected the company that I chose to do business with, uh, I contacted them and asked them to meet me. And on a handshake, I said, we're going to be doing business together. And 11 years down the road, we're still doing business together. Travel and tourism activities are officially exempt from U.S. sanctions, but the sanctions do prevent American travel companies from sending money directly to their partners in Iran. Those wire transfers have to be cleared first through the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which takes time and is limited to $10,000 per transaction. So business people like Ken Fish find other ways. That's really not a problem. We're not dealing with banks in Iran, but they always have overseas banks, whether they're in Europe or Dubai or, or some other venue. You can have surround sound in here. The banks do charge transfer fees, however, which can cut the profit margin for tour operators, like this one seen in home video. And the sanctions also influence the spending habits of tourists in Iran because of the lack of credit cards or debit card services. I would love to see more round. The sanctions have also led to a drawdown in Western investment. Quiche Island, for example, was poised in the 1970s to become a major tourist paradise. But economist Fadi Borzghadar says that potential has not been realized. If you Google Quiche, you can find a series of very chic hotels. But in fact, some of these hotels only exist online. They haven't actually been built. Hotel construction has fallen behind hotels which were scheduled to be completed five years ago. As the Europeans leave, other players take their place. There's no doubt that the Chinese will, to some extent, invest in this. Sohrab Sobani is a business consultant who recently co-authored an article on Iran's economy for the Harvard International Review. This is a natural thing. When Chinese and Asians see there is a market for them in Iran, there is no doubt 
that in addition to their investments in oil and gas, they will make an investment in tourism as well. But Faribors Khadrar says that may not provide enough help for the tourist sector. When you go to China and Beijing and Shanghai, you see that their hotels are all Western brands. The Meridian, the Hyatt, and others. If the firms doing business in China are Western, do you really want to import Chinese know-how into Iran? Despite sanctions and a loss of foreign investment, there are some positive indicators. Domestic investment in Iran's hospitality sector is said to have nearly doubled in five years, with about 500 small hotels being built across the country. Nearly 2% of the Iranian workforce is now in the tourism industry. Most of those jobs were created in just the past decade, and much of the future growth in tourism will come from Iran's private sector. Mona Rabi, VOA News, Washington. Are you looking for a comprehensive daily look at events reshaping the Middle East? Visit voanews.com forward slash me. You'll find VOA's original reporting from the region, in-depth analysis from our Washington team, VIP interviews, online polls, photo essays, and many documentaries. Bookmark us or add us to your RSS reader. That's voanews.com forward slash me. A team of U.S.-based scientists says mounting man-made air pollution over the Indian subcontinent is producing increasingly intense cyclones in the Arabian Sea. The National Science Foundation-led study finds that the pollution creates atmospheric conditions that disrupt the strong wind patterns that normally would prevent major storms from forming. The researchers say powerful tropical cyclones that would have been rare or non-existent only 30 years ago have been striking areas of the Indian subcontinent with greater frequency. The study, authors say, man-made pollutants called aerosols build up in the atmosphere and then trap soot and greenhouse gases, which form dirty brown clouds. Scientists say their findings indicate the three-kilometer-thick layer of brown clouds above the Indian subcontinent is changing atmospheric conditions over the northern Arabian Sea which is reducing the vertical wind shear traditionally responsible for keeping cyclones mild. The researchers say their findings demonstrate how air pollution from simple human actions, such as burning wood or driving a diesel engine car, can lead to significant changes in large atmospheric events, like highly destructive deadly cyclones. While human activity caused the problem, human activity also is the key to solving it. The scientists say, using technology, they already exist, such as diesel filters and energy-efficient cooking stoves, can quickly and drastically cut the amount of aerosols pumped into the Earth's atmosphere. The new study is published in the journal Nature. At a time when economists predict that South Asia's economy will grow, health experts point to hundreds of millions suffering from neglected infections, often as a result of poverty. In a series of new studies, researchers say many countries in the region bear a disproportionate burden of these diseases, and have a need for new drugs and vaccines. Vidusha Shina looks at the toll these diseases take on the poorest of the poor. Health experts say many tropical diseases that are mostly associated with sub-Saharan Africa have long been a neglected burden in South Asia as well. New research shows about one and a half billion people in South Asia suffer from severe debilitating parasitic and bacterial infections. Peter Hotez is dean of the U.S. National School of Tropical Medicine. He says poverty is the primary factor that makes people susceptible to these diseases. And because they are usually not fatal, he adds, there is no sense of urgency to combat them. And they have been easy for the world to ignore. Nobody's really dying from lymphatic filariasis or elephantiasis. And this is why it's been so hard to get these diseases to the attention of the global health policymakers. It's just tens of millions of people being disfigured, of being disabled, of being too sick to go to work every day. They do everything but kill. And that's a difficult message to sometimes convey. Hotez is the author of one of the recent studies. He says one quarter of the world's intestinal parasitic infections occur in India and the rest of South Asia. 
Phalaresis, Kala Azar, and leprosy are also widespread. He says these are the most common diseases that strike the poorest of the poor. You might have heard of the term the bottom billion, the one billion people in the world who live on no money. Well, it turns out a large percent portion of them live on, in South Asia, in India and South Asia, and these are the diseases that are trapping that bottom billion in poverty. Although some of these diseases can be treated with relatively simple immunization campaigns, treatments for others are expensive and complicated. These infections also have a tendency to recur. Amanda Glassman is the Director for Global Health at the Center for Global Development, a public policy research institute. She says the new studies should prompt governments to give diseases of the poor a higher priority. I hope that it galvanizes policymakers to pay more attention to those diseases when they're thinking about what should be funded with public monies and how those very inexpensive but effective treatments that exist can reach people in need. Experts urge Indian pharmaceutical companies to take the lead and focus not just on developing drugs for diabetes, heart disease and cancer, but on innovative therapies for neglected tropical diseases as well. Vidushi Sinha, VOA News, Washington. The Israeli government says disruptions in the websites of the Israeli military, the Mossad intelligence agency, and the Shin Beit domestic security service were caused by a technical glitch, not by a cyber attack. The websites crashed Sunday, days after a shady group of hackers calling themselves anonymous posted a video on YouTube threatening to strike back at Israel for its interception of two Gaza-bound ships. Israeli security forces boarded pro-Palestinian ships in international waters Friday as they were trying to break Israel's blockade of Gaza. On board the ships were 27 activists from various countries, including the United States, Canada, and Ireland. They said their goal was to deliver medical aid directly to Palestinians in Gaza. Israeli Defense Forces said the boarding was carried out in line with directives from the government after attempts were made to prevent the vessels from reaching Gaza. There were no reports of injuries. Last year, nine Turkish activists were killed when Israeli commandos stormed a Turkey-led aid flotilla headed for Gaza. The confrontation caused a deterioration in relations between Turkey and Israel. invite you to listen to our new podcast, Middle East Voices. Such just Google Middle East Voices weekly podcast. This week, a discussion of the end game in Syria. An Arab Spring revolutionary shares his story and the funniest jokes from the uprising in Egypt's Tahrir Square. Just Google Middle East Voices weekly podcast. The Arab Spring swept through the Middle East and North Africa, but there were also anti-government protests in Europe and one expert sees similarities. Mid-January in Tunisia, and thousands of protesters thronged the street of the capital, Tunis. Anti-government demonstrations that began in the small town of Sidi Bouzid culminated in the resignation of President Zain El Abidine Ben Ali. Then, similar protests took hold in Egypt, forcing President Hosni Mubarak from power. Mary Kaldor was part of the opposition movement in Hungary during the Cold War. She is now professor of global governance at the London School of Economics. People assumed that somehow the Middle East was different, and that was based on assumptions that somehow Islam is different, it's not like us. And that was an assumption that underpinned the war on terror too. And I think what's so wonderful about the Arab Spring is that it's disproving that assumption. It's showing that Arabs are just as democratic as everybody else. Just as the Arab Spring was building momentum, protests also erupted in parts of Europe. In Athens, thousands of people demonstrated against the Greek government's package of spending cuts and privatizations, taking over a square outside Parliament. Again, Professor Kaldor. It's all about, I think, a failure of representation, a feeling that we no longer, the political class is one class, we can't influence them. It's outrageous that... Uh, they're suddenly saying that we have to pay for what the banks did. And I think that similar feeling of outrage in the Arab world. So I think there are very many similarities between what's happening in Europe and what's happening in the Arab world. Professor Kaldor says the Arab Spring protests have changed the geopolitical landscape of the Arab world. 1989 brought an end to the Cold War. I think what 2011 did 
was to sideline the war on terror. It marginalized al-Qaeda. Al Osama bin Laden may have been physically killed in Pakistan, but he's been politically killed by the demonstrations in the Middle East. Analysts say 2011 will be etched in the memory as a year of momentous change. Every year, the Arabian Sites Film Festival, presented by the Washington International Film Festival, offers new films from the Arab world. This year, the festival is highlighting Egyptian cinema with five films that cut across a variety of genres and subjects, including the first film about the 2011 Egyptian Revolution. VOA's Julie Tabo files this report for VOA Television. Uh, it's in three, right over there. Over there yes. The Arabian Sites Festival is once again captivating audiences with films from the Arab world. The focus this year is on five films from Egypt, including the American premiere of 18 Days, the first film about the January Revolution. The movie is a compilation of short films by 10 Egyptian directors. Each offers a unique perspective on the events that changed the course of Egyptian history. Shereen Qarib is a festival's director. We have really uh, uh, 10 different stories that are all very different from one another that reflect the director's view of, of um, the Egyptian revolution. It's a mixture of um, narrative and, and fact and at the same time reflecting what was going on in the streets on those very days. Another highlight of the festival was Microphone, an award-winning docudrama that offers a close look at the underground art and music scene in Alexandria just before the revolution. Rock, hip-hop, and fusion are just a few of the music genres portrayed in the film. Qarib says for the first time, young artists had a voice. This is a, a part of the population that you never read about in newspapers. They're never on the radio. They're never interviewed on TV. You never hear their voice. And this, uh, this film, Microphone, which was made before the revolution, actually, um, gave them, you know, this outlet. Lead actor and producer Khalid Abul Naga says in retrospect, the film was a precursor to the revolution. But that wasn't evident when the film was being made. When we made the movie, we had no idea. We have, we have also to be honest, and we didn't really, uh, you know, call for a revolution. We didn't even think there will be a revolution. The movie is called Microphone because it's giving a microphone to be heard. We we're trying to get those uh, voices out. It's an underground scene before the revolution. Abul Naga was active in the uprising that overthrew Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak. He says what was once underground is now above ground, and what was above ground, the regime, is under. The power of the people is finally, this balance is becoming equal or maybe even stronger than the people in power. Any group of people feeling that they are discriminated against, they don't, they don't have their rights, now they have the means in this new age, we're just entering, to actually have enough power to topple or challenge the people in power. And that's changing all over the world. He says, however, there are obstacles, especially Egypt's military. Yes, we have now a, a horrible, horrible um, military dictatorship. In the past, this actually two days ago, they actually detained bloggers because you can't imagine the, 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 the audacity of, of, of the crime. They criticized the military. That's a crime now. But he and festival director Qarib are optimistic that freedom will prevail. The revolution has created a sense of freedom. And this freedom is going to be illustrated in the creativity that's going to come out in the films. And I think the impact is going to be huge. Julie Tabo, VOA News, Washington. The Middle East has seen many changes with the coming of the Arab Spring, but one thing remains the same, and that's humor. To speak with us about it is Adel Eskander, a media instructor at Georgetown University. Welcome to our program. 
Thank you so much for having me. With all the difficulties and challenges in the Mideast, is there room for humor? I mean, how can people laugh with everything that's been happening? Well, I think uh, people laugh irrespective of what is happening. I think, um, you know, to a large extent, humor has been uh, a real coping mechanism for publics that have lived under authoritarian, tyrannical regimes for so long. Um, if you can't really oppose them, if you can't take to the streets against them, you can at least ridicule them. So satire and parody is a large part of uh, being able to level uh, some criticism of your leaders, and this is something that we've seen across the region. I mean, um, Mubarak, for the past 20, 30 years, has been de described as the laughing cow, uh, like the Lavashkiri, the, uh, uh, the triangle um, cheese. Um, so they would have pictures of him superimposed onto the cow's face, uh, and people would refer to him as such. And, uh, and so this was one way to sort of come to grips with the persona of someone who is uh, extremely sort of dictatorial, but yet never, nevertheless uh, someone who is worthy of, of ridicule. But uh, the business of comedy can be dangerous in the Middle East. Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, regimes dealt with humor very differently. Um, so the uh, the Syrian government uh, did not, uh, did, you know, uh, would crack down on anybody who crack jokes against uh, the against the government, the Ba'ath Party, uh, Hafez al-Assad, as well as Bashar al-Assad, the current president. Um, and, uh, you know, to a large extent, uh, some countries have realized that uh, perhaps you need to open up that faucet ever so slightly and let some steam out. So uh, some of them permitted humor. So uh, the reactions to humor differ quite significantly. Uh, one example of that is the, um, the Axis of Evil comedy tour. Um, where you know, stand-up comedians from the U.S. and elsewhere, most of whom are of Arab uh, descent and background, uh, traveled around the Arab world to varying degrees of, of reaction from government. So in some instances, they're told, can't talk about uh, sex, drug, drugs, um, politics. And uh, in some cases, they, they weren't permitted to go into certain Gulf countries. Um, and in other instances, it's, it's quite acceptable because it's perceived as, um, you know, completely harmless, that this is just all fun and games, there's nothing to fear, um, and uh, it's just young people having a good time. Does it help the Arab Spring go forward? Absolutely. Um, it's, it's important because I think humor has an incredible way of recasting the relationship between the antagonist and the protagonist. Um, take, for instance, what's happening in Egypt now. You've got uh, the Egyptian sort of revolution stalling to a large extent because uh, the Supreme Council for the Armed Forces has um, failed to deliver some of the demands of, of the protesters and the revolutionaries. Um, and just so happens that yesterday, during the Eid, uh, the sort of the, um, uh, the, one of the holiest uh, periods in Islam, Eid holiday, uh, the field marshal, uh, Hussein Tantawi, who is the current leader of the Supreme Council for the Armed Forces, went to pray at a, at a mosque, and when he came out, his shoes were missing. Somebody had apparently stolen his shoes. And the amount of humor that has grown out of that is so remarkable. It's unbelievable. I mean, there are uh, people taking pictures of themselves holding shoes hostage, saying, you know, if you don't hand in the government, we won't hand in the shoe. Um, things things of that of that kind have become so incredibly prevalent, but they really underlie a very interesting subversive message, which is to say that uh, even though we can't really criticize you publicly, we're going to use humor to undermine your position. The fact that you know that you are uh, at the at the helm here, that you're running the country. So there is sort of a subversive, critical, dissident component to it, uh, but it poses as just you know, laughter and, and, and fun. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Matt. That was Adel Iskander, a media instructor at Georgetown University here in Washington. This has been VOA's Middle East Monitor. Join us Monday through Friday for news from the region and of interest to the region. Thanks for tuning in to The Voice of America. For more on the stories you've heard on our radio programs, visit our website at voanews.com. That's where you'll find in-depth reports, related stories, videos, and more from our team of correspondents. Or take the news with you by downloading podcasts of your favorite VOA programs. 
That's at voanews.com. VOA Online news for a changing world.